grandfather was a coffee farmer. His name was Sadi Botero, and he lived in the region of Quindío in Colombia. He was a self-made man who never finished primary school, but he had a sharp instinct for business. He was one of those almost fairy tale kind of characters who started with one chicken, then had a cow, then 10 cows, and then eventually had one hectare of planted coffee. And when he died, he had 15 hectares. So as you can imagine, I am literally the result of a successful coffee farm story. He managed to send my mom to university and she was the first person in her family that ever went to university. And then my mom managed to send me to a private school in Bogota where I learned English. And I'm the first person in my family who speaks another language more than Spanish. And this has opened countless doors for me, including the opportunity to share my story here with you today. I became an economist and I've spent the last 15 years working on solving poverty. Um, I started in microfinance and then funnily enough, I ended up working in coffee uh, and I've spent the last 10 years or so working with coffee farmers. I've seen hundreds of them all over the world. And I found it quite frustrating and sad that most coffee farmers do not have much hope for the future in terms of their ability to have a nice life out of coffee production. And actually, the grand majority of coffee farmers do not want their kids to be coffee farmers like them. So my grandfather used to tell us a story of when he was a little boy and he would go out in the morning to milk the cows with his brother and it was cold in the mountains and because they didn't have socks or shoes, they would put their feet in the warm cow manure because it was warm and comforting. And all of us grandchildren, we would laugh at this anecdote. But today, I don't find it funny to see how many coffee farmers still struggle to afford shoes for their kids. So the word sustainable means able to continue over time. And I think this is the biggest problem in our sector today. Sustainable coffee, this label, is being thrown all over the place. And very often, sustainable coffee is being labeled as such when the families that produce that coffee are still struggling to put food on the table. And I think this is not OK. This needs to change we need to bring into the definition of sustainable coffee the concept of living income. So what's a living income? A living income means enough income for all family members to have access to food, a shelter, education for their kids, health care, and a little bit extra for emergencies and savings after all of the farm costs have been covered. And in the most comprehensive study on the subject, and Veritas estimated that 44% of coffee farmers in the world do not make a living income. So this means that about half of the world's coffee farmers are working really hard day in, day out, so that the world can enjoy these beautiful beans, and yet they are struggling. And worst of all, I think that that number is likely to rise. Why? Because of climate change. I think we all know that coffee farmers are very, very likely to experience way deeper, tougher floods, pests, droughts. And changing the definitions is just the beginning. So after that, what can we do? What can we do to solve poverty in the coffee supply chain? Poverty is, according to the United Nations, it is the one most pressing issue of our time right now. It is the number one sustainable development goal to end poverty. And I know that it's really easy to think we're each too small to do much about it. It is 
a daunting, overwhelming thought to think that 700 million people in the world today live in extreme poverty. But I'm gonna tell you a couple of things to show you how everybody who is part of the coffee supply chain, if you have a coffee business, you can have a tangible dent on poverty. So let's take a step back for a second. Of the 700 million people in the world today that live in extreme poverty, 500 million, so the grand majority of it, are smallholder farmers. So this is a key fact. To solve poverty worldwide, we need to enable smallholder farmers to realize their full potential, maximize their incomes, and enter pathways out of poverty. So of course, this is touching coffee smallholders as well. Now, what do smallholder farmers need to thrive, to maximize their incomes? What they need is access to some relatively basic services so that they can make a proper business out of their plot of land. And those services normally include access to finance, access to know-how, and access to market. Now, coming back to coffee, I feel in our sector there's a lot of talk about the coffee price. So often the whole poverty problem is then reduced to oh, the price is just too low, we need to pay higher prices. And I agree the price is important, it's really important, and I'm really happy to see these being discussed with urgency, but price is just one part of the equation. A farmer's revenues are defined by price times quantity of coffee produced. And what are the drivers of quantity? One is good agricultural practices know-how, right? They need to know how to prune, how to manage the trees, etc. But the other piece is being able to properly invest in the farm. So, you know, a farmer may know that they need to fertilize their farm, but if they don't have the money to buy the fertilizer, fertilization is not going to happen. So, and. What I'm seeing as well in our sector is that a lot of the sustainability initiatives from NGOs, roasters, governments, are all focused on training farmers, training farmers on good agricultural practices. And again, same as with price, it's important, sure. But I think the elephant in the room right now is access to finance. Because if a farmer is trained 10 times on how to fertilize, but they don't have the money to fertilize, then you know, the training is not really gonna do much. So access to finance to me right now is this big missing piece. Just imagine beyond coffee farmers, any business being able to thrive or even survive without access to capital. I mean, those of you who work for a business here today, access to capital is just, you know, such a critical piece for any single business. So it's critical for a coffee farm as well. And yet, IFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture and Development, estimates that 99% of smallholder farmers in the world do not have access to formal forms of financing. So what this means is that smallholder farmers, including coffee smallholders, are trapped in a cycle where basically they have low incomes, so they cannot invest in the farm, so they have a low production, then they have a low income, and the cycle continues again and again. And this is why this is called a poverty trap, because they are trapped in this cycle. In the latest study on this, GI said the International German Development Agency estimated that smallholder coffee farmers in Uganda who would borrow money from a local middleman in order to pay for urgent needs would end up paying an effective monthly interest rate of 170%. This is not effective annual interest rate. This is effective monthly interest rate that they're paying to have access to cash in times of need. And Uganda might be an extreme case, 
or Africa in general, and the poorer the farmer, the more that they're gonna be exploited because the more that they have this need. But this is happening with virtually every single smallholder farmer in the world. So here's where I think there's an opportunity for those of us in the coffee supply chain to provide financing, have a dent in poverty, and actually make a better business for ourselves as well. A microfinance revolution began about 40 years ago. Microfinance in general is about making loans to poor people. And this began with Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And what the microfinance revolution has done is prove that poor people are also good subjects of credit. Because before that, it was believed that only people who had assets to pledge or a pay slip to show should get a loan. And then Grameen and other institutions in the space, they came in and they designed new methodologies for lending to people who didn't have assets and didn't have pay slips. And for example, they de designed something called group lending where people get into groups and they guarantee each other. So basically it's social capital guaranteeing or backing the loans and it solves what's called the problem of informational asymmetry, meaning the lender sometimes doesn't know who they can lend to. They don't know who will pay back because people don't have assets and don't have pay slips. So within the group, this is solved because they screen each other. They know each other. And this has been massive. Literally hundreds of thousands of people have now have access to credit thanks to microfinance. But unfortunately, this whole sector has focused in urban centers. And the reason for that is because urban centers have a high population density, and so the costs of operate, operating such a microfinance scheme are lower. On top of that, the microentrepreneurs in cities also face less risks than in agriculture. So even after 40, 50 years of microfinance, smallholder farmers are still not having access to finance. So let me get back to my point. So who can finance farmers? And it's those of us in the supply chain. First of all, the companies in the supply chain have way less informational asymmetries. Like, we know the business, we know the farmers, we know how big the harvest is coming or not. That's one part. And on the other part, the operational costs of reaching the farmer are way lower than for a financial institution. So a lot of traders, for example, have already infrastructure in some of the most remote regions in Asia, Africa, and Latin America to source coffee. So if you've got this whole infrastructure set up to source and buy coffee, why not leverage that to also provide services to farmers, including financing? And you know, I've been asking myself a lot this question, why isn't this more common? Why isn't this you know, part of kind of the way, the, the, the plain vanilla way of doing business within coffee? It's actually very absent that farmers receive financing as part of a business relationship with a buyer. Um, and so I spent the last seven years working on this. And I know it's not easy, so it takes a lot of work. You know, often companies are intimidated, it's complicated, but more than anything, it takes putting skin in the game. Why? Because it's way easier to focus your sustainability activities around training farmers. If the farmer succeeds or not, if the farmer learns anything or not from your training, the company doesn't really feel it. But if you finance a farmer, and for example, a farmer is hit by a, by a drought or a flood, by some kind of external shock that they cannot control, the farmer cannot pay back. And guess what? The lender now is basically sharing in the risks with the farmer. And I think it's time that this happens, because 
It's not sustainable that farmers absorb all the risks of agriculture by themselves. This needs to be shared across the supply chain, and financing is one way of doing that. Now, the other thing I've learned is that, yes, it can be intimidating, but technology is changing rapidly. There's so much data now that can be used to create a credit score, just even you know, simplifying it even more. Like anyone who has data on coffee deliveries from farmers basically has the basis to figure out the indebtedness capacity of farmers. Because how much coffee they've delivered in the past, it's an excellent proxy for how much they can pay back with future coffee deliveries. So I think there's lots of hope in this space. But if you're still not convinced, <laughs> I do have a couple more reasons why everyone in the coffee business should consider doing farmer financing. And the first one is sourcing capacity, like I'm saying, your pure business interest. Financing farmers creates a super sticky relationship with them. You become their first option when they're thinking who to sell their coffee beans to. And sourcing capacity is a huge driver of the overall business. Now, the final reason is I don't think that this will be entirely optional in the future. I think successful corporations in the 21st century will be held accountable not just to their shareholders, but to every part of the human ecosystem that they touch. And it's not going to be okay to have a successful brand, a su successful business that thrives on the shoulders of poverty. The European Union, for example, has passed a law that says very soon European companies will have to prove that all the coffee they import into Europe is deforestation free. And deforestation is not going to end as long as there is poverty. But on the other side of the coin, maybe there's a more positive part to it as well, which is the focus of this entire panel, which is extrinsic attributes. It's the possibility to create brand value based on your impact on poverty. So think about Tony Chocolonis. They are the most successful chocolate brand in the last five years, the most disruptive, fastest growing. And what's distinctive about them is not that they have the very best chocolate, like the, the tastier or so, what is distinctive is that their entire brand, their entire packaging, the whole thing is all based on their chocolates being a vehicle to end modern slavery in the cocoa supply chain. Or think about Bellwether Coffee, how much attention and respect they've received recently because they've said, they've announced they're committing to buying 100% of their coffee at living income prices. So, Poverty in the coffee supply chain needs to end, but it will take way more than doing certification audits or running compliance questionnaires to make sure that farmers meet X, Y, Z standards. I really like to invite everyone in the coffee business to use their superpowers, to use their business as a catalyst to end poverty. And there are two tangible actions to take ASAP. One is revise your definition of sustainable coffee and make sure that it includes a living income component. And two, start financing farmers. Use your relationship with farmers. Use your sourcing as a vehicle to also finance them. Every coffee farmer that has the opportunity to run their farm at full potential, maximize their income, and enter a pathway out of poverty will mean a world of difference to the entire family and truly for all the generations that follow. Thank you.